Shalom, Israel. Shalom, Shalom. Brother Nakwam, watch me for Israel coming back at you with these precepts. And another cold cut, giving, of course, our honor and our glory to Yahweh. Bashma Mashiach, Kumalak Yavashai. Double honor to the elect elders of the house of David that's been in this truth for decades and decades, patiently waiting for the second coming of Mashiach, Kumalak Yavashai. A hearty, mighty Shalom to all of the mighty men of the Most High God who are out there in the highways and byways, pushing this truth magnifying the ministry presenting their body as a living sacrifice and enduring all things for the elect sake shalom 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 to all of the men that may not be out there in the highways and byways as of yet but they're working on it they're getting built up in the spirit they're praying they're fasting they're studying they're being diligent and abounding in the work of the lord shalom 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 to all of the aqua out there the sincere sisters out there holding it down in the households referencing their husbands being submissive and diligent and moving in the spirit of our righteous foremothers. Uh, shalom, shalom, shalom to the ancient men, the children, everybody tuning in their live. Don Israel, T. Seller, shalom. Nigel Blends, Passport Hebrew. Uh, T. Sellers, Elijah Jones, HBK Ent, Divinely Fashion, Kyoko Banyamian, Malcolm Kufi, Brother Believe, Divine in Nature, LLC. Abayanam, Yasha Allah, K Paradise, Judah in the house, Taylor B, CC Levi, Line of Judah, Nataza, Amawan, and everybody else tuning in and that will tune in, Lord willing. The topic of this code cut is WFI Law School, Secrets of the Feast Days, and every high holy day explained. Right? So we're going to go to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Other chapters, other precepts in the Bible, and go into these ceremonial laws and particular commandments that the Heavenly Father has given us that separates us in terms of keeping particular days uh, on a high regard, right? It separates us from these other nations. They have their days, they have their Christmas, July 4th, Thanksgiving, uh, New Year's Day, Halloween, Father's Day, Mother's Day, Flag Day, Arbor Day, Earth Day. Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day. I mean, they have wicked days and days with no substance and days that don't pertain into our history, more importantly, our God and our nationality. So we as a people, part of repenting and coming back to this truth or coming into this truth and coming back to Yahweh Bashmi Abushai as an Israelite, it's also knowing the days that the Heavenly Father has given you and you have to take these days and hold them in high regard because the Mosa has taken these days and held them in high regard, right? Let's go to Ecclesiasticus, right? We have to learn these feast days and what they actually mean, right? What they mean on a spiritual level. So we're going to dive into what these high holy days mean and how they pertain to us as a people, right? Let's go to Ecclesiasticus chapter 33, right? First and foremost, right? Let's go to Sirach chapter 33, right? And we'll get verse, we'll start at, let's see, Salakia. Uh, we'll start at seven. Okay. Ecclesiastes chapter 33 and seven. Why doth one day excel another? When as all the light of every day in the year is of the sun. Meaning what? How can one day supersede another day, right? Spiritually. Uh, a person may ask this. This is an actual question. Why does one day excel another? How can a day on, on the 14th day of the first month be or, or the 14th day at even be held on a high regard than the regular first day of the week, right? What separates the days, right? If the sun shines on every day, then how can these days be different? That's what the question is asking, right? Why does one day excel another when as all the light of every day in the years of the sun? So if the sun shines on every day, what distinguishes days? Well, here, here's the next verse the Mosai tells you. By the knowledge of the Lord, they would distinguish. And he altered seasons and feasts. Because you wouldn't be able to know what days are different by looking at the sun. You have to know the spiritual direction and guidance that the Mosai has given you. The instruction on how to know what day is holy and what day isn't holy. Right? So it's all based off of the knowledge of Yahweh Bashmi Shah. He has deemed the Sabbath day. And sanctified it as a holy day, right? The most sacred day pursuing the second Maccabees, the sixth chapter. He has created the feast of unleavened bread, he has created the feast of weeks, he has created the feast of tabernacles, 
he is the one that has set this calendar and said there's going to be seven days in a week. The lunar cycle is going to run in around 29.5 days. A, sun, a solar cycle is going to be 365.25 days. A complete lunar cycle going through 12 moons is going to be 354 point so-called 11 days. The Most High determined these things, right? He created these constellations, Orion and Pilates, right? Maseroth and Arcturus and their sons. Everything that's celestial within a firmament has been ordained by Yahweh Bashmi Yahweh He has numbered the stars. He knows the name of the stars. He has names to these different celestial lights, and it's all based off of his knowledge. And we're, we were given that knowledge to know what days are set apart from other days. Right? Verse 9. So right, chapter 33 and 9. Some of them hath he made high days and hallowed them. Right? And some of them hath he made ordinary days. So certain days are high days. Right? Certain days are days that are put on high regard. And there are certain instructions on how to make sure you keep that day holy or on a high regard. And he uh, hallowed them, meaning he sanctified them. And what sanctifies the date? The instructions that you're supposed to accept that pertain to that day. That's what sanctifies it, right? The statutes and the ordinances within those 24 hours, all right? And some of them have to be made ordinary days. Some days are ordinary days, like today. Right now, today is an ordinary day, all right? It's the first day of the so-called week. So-called Saturday night at sundown to so-called uh, Sunday night at sundown, right? That was the first day of the week. Now you got your second day of the week, Sunday night at sundown to so-called Monday night, right? So you have different days that the Most High created. Now, if you want to read about your high holy days, which we're going to go into, this is found in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Now, there are other high holy days that are not mentioned in Leviticus chapter 23. Right? What are those days? Those that's Purim, Day of Simon, Destruction of Nicanor. Right? Those are a few days that are mentioned. Day of Simon, uh, destruction of Nicanor, uh Purim, right? Um, and I believe that that um those are your three main ones, right? And we'll touch on other days as well that we go through, right? But the majority of your feast days are found in Leviticus 23 and the feast of dedication. So like the feast of dedication. That's also within those days that you read about in Maccabees, right? So Maccabees contains, you know, three major feast days and Esther contains another one. So you got your feast of dedication, destruction of Nicanor, day assignment, and you also have uh, Purim. So those are four feast days that are going to be mentioned in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. All right. And I want to go through the main ones in Leviticus 23 and also kind of get into those um, if time permits. Right, so this is Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feast. So these feast days are holy convocations. The word holy in the Hebrew is kodash, it means set apart. Right, when something is set apart, it means that this day is different. All right. And it's a convocation. What is what is the definition of a convocation? Etymologically speaking, a convocation, right, is a holy calling or to call people together. That's a convocation. Let's pull it up. Con meaning with and vocare is the Latin for to call. All right, the Latin infinitive. Now, this is um convocation, Latin conva. Convocatinum, which is the uh, nominative, convoking, calling, or assembling together, right? Con or con meaning with and vocare meaning to call. You see that? So the word convocation literally means to call, right? Or to call people together. Now, when it's a you people could have a convocation in the world. Jake, you have convocations when you're at the club. That's a convocation. When you're freaking off, women are shaking their damn uh, uh, behind. Men are there ready to fight, right? There's drinks and alcohol and lewdness and sex and folly and pills and weed smoke and, and violence. That's a convocation, but it's, it's definitely not a holy convocation. When you sit there and you gather with your family and slice that turkey up and serve mac and cheese, mashed potatoes, ham, hot greens, and sweet potato pie, that is also a convocation, but is it a holy convocation? No. You're convocating under the stigma 
and statutes of the so-called white man. So you have convocations, but you have holy convocations where Israelites are called to assemble together in order and in wisdom and in unison, right? To perform the ordinances of this day. And as much, again, as much as you was into these worldly days, and Jake, you go all out for your birthday. You went all out for Christmas. You went all out for New Year's, man. You went all out for Valentine's. So you broke bank on particular feast days and traveled and, and spent all types of money on, on one ways and round trip tickets to go to islands for all types of things, man. You know, anniversaries and honeymoons. And you got off on this thing. You have to match that zeal, but even seven times more when it comes to seeking out these feast days. Right. That's what Baruch chapter four said. Right. For as it was your mind, let's get it to go astray from the Lord. So being returned, seek him 10 times more. Right. So being returned, seek him 10 times more. Right. This is Baruch chapter four. Right. And verse Slaki. Let's get this Baruch. For that was your uh, that was your mind to go astray. 28, Salakia. Baruch chapter 4 and 28. For as it was your mind to go astray from the Most High, so being returned, seek him 10 times more. You see that? So you got to go 10 times harder than you did when you celebrated Christmas. Thanksgiving and July 4th, when you caped up with that American flag on your back, when you opened up that grill and prepped work and thawed the chicken out and fought over who's going to grill and who's going to fight and bring the famous potato salad. Jake, you went all out 10 times harder. The memorial of the blowing of the trumpets draws not. You should get that much more into that feast day. The Day of Atonement is, what, 10 days after that? Five days after the Day of Atonement is the Feast of Tabernacles. And you have to get into this thing and understand exactly what these feast days are about. Ten times harder than what you did in the world. You're commanded to do so, to have that zeal and passion to serve the Most High. That's what it means to serve the Most High with all your heart, right? Your mind, your body, and soul. It's like this is Deuteronomy, right? Chapter six and verse five. I'm going to start at four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, right? Shema Yasha'ala, Yahweh Allah, Yahweh Yahweh Akkad, right? Verse five. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. So you got to get into this thing. Can't have, you know what, these feast days. And, and be oblivious to when they have fallen and think that they're a thing of naught because you're commanded to keep them. And if you don't keep them, that's a sin. And, and, and the wages of sin is what? Death. Right? So let's actually, there's, these aren't optional things, right? Optional feast days. These are holy convocations. Now the Lord is going to go into the Sabbath day, right? And then he's going to go into major feast days. All right, so let's read on. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. And holy convocation, ye shall do no work therein. It is, it's like, it is the Sabbath of the Lord and all your dwellings. You see that? So the Sabbath day is documented within this chapter, right? When we keep the Sabbath day, so-called Friday night, the so-called Saturday night, right? The sixth day. At sundown until the seventh day at sundown. That's your Sabbath day. No work, no buying, no selling, no cooking. You understand, no doing your own pleasure, speaking your own words, no vanities, no sex on the Sabbath, right? And we have independent breakdowns on the Shabbat, so I'm not going to really dive deep into the Sabbath day, right? I want to kind of get into the rest of these feast days. Verse four, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. So every feast day doesn't fall in the same week. They come in particular seasons, right? And our feast days are determined by the moon, right? Because you have so-called 12 moons that run throughout the year. And in each moon, there's a particular feast day, right? Or at a set moon, there could be a given feast day. The seventh moon, the first moon, right? The, you know, these different, the ninth moon. Within these moons, as you go through your lunar calendar, then you understand that, hey, look, there's a feast day coming up in this moon or this month, all right, at its appointed time. That's what Ecclesiastes chapter 43 is going into. 
right? Let's get that to Sirach 43 and verse 6. All right, Ecclesiasticus chapter 43 and 6. So our feast days are based off of the moon. Your week is not based off of the moon because the week was already in succession and rolling before the moon was even created. So your week isn't determined off of the moon, but you have set feast days that coincide with the lunar cycle. All right. So this is Ecclesiasticus chapter 43 and verse six. He made the moon also to serve in her season for a declaration of times and a sign of the world. So the moon comes, the moon is used to distinguish the night from the day, the darkness from the light. You know it's night when you see the moon, right? You know it's dark when you see the moon. That's what it means when it means the moon was created to serve in her season. The moon operates at a, at a particular shift, right? Of so-called 12 hours. And it, it has many purposes. The moonlight within itself serves particular purposes when it alters and moves the tides, right? It serves as a light and as a, as a sign for particular animals to breed. A lot of animals breed around the time of the full moon, particular uh, amphibians and, and mammals. They breed around the time of the full moon. A lot of uh, horticulturalists and people that deal with the almanac and farmers, they would plant around the full moon due to how the moon would move the tides. Right. And it will lead to a, a harvest. Right. So the moon serves many purposes in her in her season. You have full moons, half moons, uh, crescents, waning gibbous, waxing gibbous. Right. A new moon. You may have a blue moon, what they call the blue moon. They have all of these names, you know, for these uh, uh, phases of the moon. Right. Verse seven from the moon is the sign of feast. A light that decreaseth in her perfection. See that? So the moon is a sign of a feast. When it's a new moon, you know it's a feast day. The new moon is when you can't see the moon. It's a it's a dark moon. Now, how you may say, well, how do you how do you how do you know it's a sign when you can't see it? Well, anything, whether it's light or dark, can be a sign. You understand? When it when it's the sun goes down, it's a sign that it's a new day, even though it's dark. Right. So just because something is dark doesn't mean it can't be a sign. Our people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You're into Christianity. You're into Islam. You're into all types of philosophies and politics. You're in gross darkness. That's a sign that you're destroyed. Darkness is as much as a sign to man as is light. Right. So when that new moon comes in and you'll be able to determine as that moon wanes down. That's why I read to light that decreaseth in her perfection. The moon is perfected when it's full and as it wanes down in light and it gets to where there's an absence of light, that's your new moon. The month is called after her name, increasing wonderfully in her changing, being an instrument of the armies above, shining in the firmament of heaven. So the word month literally goes back to the word moon. All right. And you have 12 so-called moons that run throughout the year. And Esau calls these moons. January, February, March, April, May, June, right, etc. You understand? But in the ancient world, we have our own names for these moons, right? So let's read on. And the moon increases one different her changes. So it starts as a dark moon. Everything starts in darkness, right? The creation started in darkness. Babies start in darkness. Seeds start in darkness. You, your wisdom, it was started in darkness until the light of Yahweh Shai rested upon you and you increased in light you understand everything starts in darkness and it increases in light and once you're increased in light you have been perfected right so it increases wonderfully in her changing being an instrument of the armies above shining in the firmament of heaven and the point i really want is verse seven for the moon is a sign of feast right let's go to genesis chapter 1 and 14 right genesis chapter 1 and 14. we put a calendar out every year through the spirit right every year through the spirit of prophet yahweh bashmir was shy we put our calendar out and a lot of other congregations they put their calendar out some brothers keep a lunar sabbath so their feast days are a little bit different some brothers say the full moon is the new moon so their feast days are a little bit different some brothers say that the new moon starts when it's a, a waning crescent so their, their times are going to be a little bit different right 
Genesis chapter 1 to 14. And the Most High said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. See, that's so what the moon is for a sign and a sun. When there's an eclipse or a blood moon, right? That's a sign that judgment draws not, that war and destruction and massive shootings and killings are going to fall upon the earth. You understand? Now, the moon is also for seasons, right? Meaning appointed times, right? At set times, there's going to be a moon manifested to let man know what should be done within those 30 days. The moon is for days and years to count your days of your feast days that we're reading in Leviticus 23 and for your years. All right. So let's go to Psalms chapter 104 and 19. Right. Psalms chapter 104 and 19. It reads, he appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knoweth his going down. So that's plain. When it says seasons, don't think that's talking about summer, winter, spring, and fall. The moon has no influence on weather, on weather patterns for a prolonged period of time. That word seasons is just appointed times to, so man can receive instruction on what's going to happen within those 29.5 days or so. Is there a major feast day or is there some judgment coming? How should we gather together? That's what the moon symbolizes. And if you kind of get into this, if you're in the spirit, you know, you, you can go outside and you can look at the moon and you, you can pretty much pinpoint what day of the week it is. You know, there are, there are brothers that can actually look at the sun and know what hour of the day it is. So our forefathers, they were well acquainted. Okay, Salaki, right? Salaki, let me get back into it, right? Spirits, right? Let me get right back into it. So we're going into Genesis, the eighth chapter, right? This is Genesis chapter eight and verse 22. It reads, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and winter, Salaki, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And these are what you call your so-called four seasons. So you have feast days that come in the seed time. You have feast days that come in the harvest time. You have feast days that come when the, when the temperature is low. You have uh, feast days that come when the temperature is high. You have feast days that come in when the sun has an extended period of time. And you have feast days when the days are darker and shorter, right? You have feast days that, and all your feast days start at night, right? And some feast days are night and day, 
right? So seed time is spring, harvest is fall, summer and winter, you know what they are, right? And what, you know, but it wasn't supposed to rhyme, but that's the feast days. These are your major feast days, right? And they fall throughout these different times of the year. Now, your first feast date is mentioned is the Passover. This is Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 5. And the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. See, that's where your Passover is your first major high holy day. And it falls on the 14th day of the first month at even. Your 14th day of the first month at even is your 15th day, right? Your 15th day would start on the previous so-called day at sundown, all right? So they're really just saying the same thing. The 14th day of the first month at even is the 15th day. That begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the Passover, all right? It reads... And on the 15th day of the same month, it's the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. Right? So we go over the Passover often, but the Passover, right, consists of four major components, right, when it comes to the feast day, right? And if you want to know more in depth about the Passover, read the entire book of Exodus, chiefly chapter 1 through chapter 15. If you want to get deep into the Passover, on the Passover, you're required to eat lamb, drink the wine, bitter herbs to eat and to eat the unleavened bread. The Passover is about Yahweh Bashmi Abashai delivering our forefathers out of captivity, out of Egypt, but also about the blood of the lamb sanctifying us and allowing the death angel to pass over us. If you didn't mark the doors and the lentil of your house with the blood of the lamb, right? So let's read this real quick. This Exodus, <clears throat> I'm going to get straight to the point, right? Exodus chapter 12 and verse, let's see, uh, verse 6. And ye shall keep it up, meaning keep the lamb up, until the 14th day of the same month. And a whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take up the blood and strike it on the two side posts. And on the upper doorposts of the houses, wherein they show eat it. So you're supposed to take the blood, and they show pictures of that. If you want to look up, let's see, um, blood on doorposts for the Passover. And our forefathers had to actually do this. Because the blood symbolizes, on the deeper level, since we're going to kind of to the secrets of it, it's really talking about the blood of Yahweh Shai. And it really doesn't matter who's in that house, right? It's, it's not according to the righteousness of the people in that house that saved them on Passover. There's no account of Israel being extremely righteous and keep, they didn't even have the law and the totality, right? So it's not about your righteousness when it comes to the Passover. It's about, are you sanctified by the blood of the lamb? Do you believe in Yahweh Bashmi? I was shot through faith. You understand? Does his blood cover you so when destruction comes on the earth, is that destruction going to pass over you? Or are you going to get caught up in that destruction if you are not sanctified by the blood of the Lamb? So although there was a physical house, on a deeper level, we are that, we are that house. right? We are a house that has to be sanctified with the blood of the Lamb. Let's get that in the book of 2 Corinthians. Let's just go to Job chapter 4 to prove that we are that house, right? Let's go to Job chapter 4 and verse 17. Shall mortal man be more just than the most high? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants and his angels he charged with folly. How much less them that dwell in houses of clay? So our body are called are called houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before the moth. See, that's why our bodies are called houses of clay, because we are made from the elements of the clay and the earth. Your body consists of magnesium, uh, potassium, iron is in your blood, 
hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, right? Because you are made out of the same elements of the earth, right? Let's get another quick precept on us being uh, formed out of the dust of the ground or being called houses, right? Second Corinthians chapter five and verse one, it reads, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So you have an earthly house where your spirit rests in. That's the body you have now that's subject to sin, pain, passions, right? Anger, wrath, malice. You understand uh, uh, gladness, etc. And then you have a spiritual house. So you, your spirit does not just vanish within the thin air upon your death or your birth. Your spirit goes up to the third heaven. You have a spiritual dwelling place. But right now in the terrestrial realm, you have an earthly house. And your earthly house still has to be sanctified and sprinkled by the blood of the Lamb. All right, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and 1. Another quick precept on that. 1 Peter 1 and 1. Elect according to the, uh, verse 2, Salakia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of the Most High, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Yahweh Shai Hamashiach, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So you see how the sprinkling of the blood of Yahweh Shai Hamashiach is resting upon the elect. So when you're keeping the Passover, you're thinking and meditating about the blood of the Lamb that's going to cover you, that has covered your fathers in the time of Egypt. You should know about the 10 plagues. Right, you should get to the point where you know the 10 plagues off the top of the head. Right? You should get into Moses, know who Moses, Aaron, Miriam are, knowing what the who out of Mosai set them up. Right? And you have to get into that spirit of the Passover. And the Passover is, is probably the top high holy day within the calendar. All right. It's the most major high holy day. Because it deals with Yahweh Shai's sacrifice. Yahweh Shai is that Passover. Right, let's go to First Corinthians chapter First Corinthians chapter five and verse seven. It reads, Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, as ye are but even sacrifice for us, because Yahweh is the Passover, he is that lamb. So your lamb, which is the key component of your Passover meal is representative of Hamashiach Yahweh right? So when you're eating your lamb, it's not just, okay, I'm eating lamb for the first time. I've never had it before. I always eat steak and chicken, but damn, this lamb is good. It's not about that, right? It's about understanding what that lamb represents and the solemnity of Yahweh sacrifice on that day for us, for us to be in this truth. You also have your other three components of the Passover, which are your bitter herbs. Your bitter herbs represent what? The hardcore bondage of our fathers uh, that that it, um, that they experienced in Egypt, even the bondage of sin that we're in, right, and a yoke that that is placed upon the sons of Adam, right. You also have what your wine. Your wine is symbolic for the blood of Yahweh Shai, right, to allow you to access the New Testament through His blood and faith. Let me get that quick precept, right. Then I kind of want to move on because we got a lot of feast days we got to touch, right. A lot of feast days we have to touch. Leviticus chapter, it's like you, Luke chapter 22 and verse 17. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I said to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of the most high shall come. You see that? So Yahweh said, I'm going to abstain from the wine until the kingdom is established. Right? And why did he give him the wine? Because the wine represents his blood. We're going to read that. Then he had the unleavened bread. The unleavened bread represents the body without sin, right? And that's why Yahweh Shai put it in the Apostle Paul's heart to say, let us therefore keep the feast, not with old leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, paraphrasing. Leaven represents sin. You want to purge out your spirit of leaven, rather that's lust, rather that's folly, rather it's pride, vanity. You want to purge that out. Every day, but chiefly, you want to be cognizant of that during the time of the Passover. All right. Luke 22 and 18. I mean, verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it 
and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament, and my blood, which is shed for you. So that as they drank of the wine, it was symbolic of them accepting the blood of Yahweh Shai into their vessel. What that first feast day is about on a deeper level it's about the blood of the lamb and the wine and the bitter herbs and what they truly represent right and the lord said in leviticus chapter 23 and 6 seven days ye must eat unleavened bread and seven is a literal number in this context but seven if you have eyes that are enlightened you understand that seven is a number that means completion or perfection so Let's prove that real quick. Let's let's just get two quick precepts about that number seven. Psalm chapter 12 and verse six. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried and a furnace of earth purified seven times. So seven means completion or perfection because the word is perfect. Let's get another um, another precept dealing with seven. Leviticus chapter 4 and 6. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle up the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. So seven has a number that means, or seven is a number that means completion or perfection. So when the Mosai is telling you seven days, he must eat unleavened bread. That's literally seven days. But spiritually, we should always be perfecting our body. And completing our body and the spirit and not having leaven in us, right? Seven days forever until the kingdom come. And even after that, in the world to come, we should do our due diligence to make sure we do not have leaven in our body. All right. Here are the statutes of the Feast of Eleven Bread. Leviticus chapter 23 and 7. And the first day ye shall have a holy convocation, ye should do no servile work therein. So certain feast days, you cannot do servile work. Servile work is defined as work for hire. Root word, service. What is a service that you may provide? You may paint houses. You may cut grass, right? You may uh, bake cakes, right? Or, or rather, you may, I'll use a different example. You may be a blacksmith. You may make weapons, right? You cannot do work for hire. The only work you can do is, is work that pertains to the feast day. That's slaughtering the lamb. Right, that's getting a bit of herbs, that's making the unleavened bread, that's bringing out the dishes, the pots to make the food. That's the only work you can do on the first day of the Feast of Eleven Bread. And you're commanded to congregate. Your brothers and I don't have to congregate. I do my own thing. Well, you're violating Yahweh Bashkin Yahweh's commandments. Verse 8 But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. And the seventh day, is an holy convocation. Ye should do no servile work therein. So the first day is regarded as a Sabbath, and the seventh day is regarded as a Sabbath. Also, those days you cannot buy on those days. You cannot sell on those days. You have to keep those days holy. Leviticus chapter 23 and 9. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, when ye be coming to the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So this is where you get your feast of first fruits from. The feast of first fruits coincides with the agricultural concept of harvesting your crops during the earlier part of the year. All right. So during this time. You would harvest your first fruits. Those are the, it's, those are the fruits and the crops that first came up after the so-called winter time. Because remember, this is during the springtime, so you're harvesting all of your crops, and you're taking those crops. You may want to eat them. You may want to take them to your house, but you, they're sanctified. These things belong to the priest. The first fruits literally belong to the priest. All right, and that's their uh, a reward. For their labor and it goes to the most high everything that comes out first belongs to the most high even when you read exodus the 13th chapter you read about 
anything that comes out of the matrix, meaning out of the mother's womb, first is sanctified and belongs to the Most High. You know, the first day of the month belongs to the Most High. It's consecrated. So things that are first belong to Yahweh, Bashmi Shai. even your first fruits. Right now, you would literally take those first fruits and you would give them to the free, uh, priests during the harvest. Now, what do the first fruits mean on a spiritual level? Right? Well, the Lord said that we should be the first fruits of his creature. Right? Let's get that in James chapter 1 and 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Meaning we were born again by this truth. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So as much as the, the children of Israel in the ancient world will present these first fruits to the priest, we also are first fruits being presented to Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. And what makes us the first fruits? Us being born again. Us being part of that first, hopeful first resurrection. Us coming to the knowledge of Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. We are those first fruits, those crops and seeds that have been nourished and watered and given the appropriate amount of light in order to be sanctified and brought to the Most High. Right? So you have the literal first fruits, which are the plants, or the, rather you had the weed or the barley that grew up in that time. And other things, and then you have the man who are those first fruits on a spiritual level, right? Let's get uh Revelation chapter 14. Like I said, I'm not going to go in depth in every major high holy day. I do want to touch on the spiritual meaning of these days. Okay, this is a uh, Revelation chapter 14 at verse 4. This is the 140 and 4,000, 12,000 from each tribe. Let's read about these men. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. See that? So these men aren't defiled with women, meaning they're not tainted by the philosophies and politics and the ways of this world. They're pure. That's what they're called virgins. They're untainted and uncorrupted as much as a, a virgin woman is. These men also follow the lamb wherever he go, right? Yahweh Shah said, don't eat pork. They ain't going to eat pork. Yahweh Shah said, go out in the highways and byways. They're going to go out in the highways and byways. Yahweh Shah said, you got to die for this truth. You best believe 144K, they're going to die for the truth, right? And they also these were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto God and to the land see that's what 144,000 are the chief first fruits and when you really get into it there are some of the first spirits that have been created right they are the first spirits that have been attached to Yahweh Shai. why do you think Peter Andrew James John Nathaniel Matthew all of these men were instantly attracted to Yahweh Bashmi Yahweh Shai? They were compelled to follow him because they were created to follow him first. Spirits like Peter and John were some of the first spirits to be attached to Yahweh Shah. And 144,000, they follow after. They're the first fruits. They're some of the first spirits that have been created by the Mosai. And when they're manifest on the earth, those men have to be brought back to the Mosai. That's why Yahweh Shah told them in John chapter, I believe, 15. And ye shall bear witness, because ye had been with me from the beginning. Right? This is John chapter 15 and 27. And he was talking to the apostles. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye had been with me from the beginning. That's not just talking about the beginning of Yahweh Shah's ministry. Right? That's speaking about from the spirit world. That's where they can bear witness, because they've always been with the Lord. You understand? Those were the spirits that were initially created. So when you're dealing with the feast of first fruits, it's not just you bringing crops and vegetation to the high priest who can eat, right? It's really on a deeper level. You're diving into the spirits of the elect, the souls that are going to be gathered and brought to Yahweh Shai during the time of the harvest. Because the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels, right? Let's get that in Matthew chapter 13. 
right? Let's get that. This is St. Matthew chapter 13, right? And verse 38, right? Matthew chapter 13 and 38. So now you have to touch on the spiritual aspect of not only the first fruits, but also the harvest, right? It reads, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one, right? Who's the wicked one? Satan. Verse 39, the enemy that sold them is the devil, the harvest. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. You see that? So now that harvest is spiritual too, right? When they were gathering up those crops, it's a spiritual representation of Yahweh Shah coming to gather up the first fruits. So during that feast day, you're thinking about, hey, look, am I am I part of the first fruits? Am I going to make it when Yahweh Shah returns? And the end of the world, how has my life been? And it's true. Have I been repenting? Have I been keeping the commandments? Have I been diligent? Have I been steadfast? Have I been unmovable? Right? Have I reproved, rebuked, and exhorted with all long suffering and doctrine as I have been commanded? Right? So now during that feast day, you're thinking about the harvest too. And you're wondering in the end of the world, are you going to make it? You're praying to how about Shmuel Shai that he is the one that delivers you. Because the reapers are the angels. Right? Because the angels are going to do the do the reaping. You know? It reads, as therefore, and a lot of our feast days, a quick point, a lot of our feast days have roots within the agriculture side of things. Horticulture and farming and husbandry. Right? But the husbandry is also spiritual. And husbandry is going out in the field, breaking up the ground, planting seeds, watering your crops, making sure they get the right light, pruning out the bad, you understand, uh, keeping wild serpents and beasts and foxes away, right? It's your job to maintain your vineyard on a very spiritual level, right? Yeah. It's your job to maintain your vineyard on a spiritual level. Verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. So in the end of the world, the tares, meaning those who may have known that they were Israelites, could it, could be the other nations, right? Tares are basically everybody that's not the elect, when it's all said and done, right? They're all going to be burned in the fire. It's not just a few Israelites that may look like an Edomite that's going to get burnt in the fire. No, they're all going to get burnt in the fire in the end of the world right here's what that harvest is about the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire there should be wailing and gnashing of teeth you see that so when you're dealing with that law of the feast of first fruits understand the concept of what the first fruits represent they were actual crops that were given to the priests to sustain them and to, to sanctify the first that came out of the earth, but also the man of the Lord. They are the first fruits presented to Yahweh Bashem Shai as a pleasant plant, right? And the harvest is symbolic for the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Let's get one more in the harvest, right? I actually want Revelation 1 and 14. So it's like, yeah. So I can Revelation chapter 14. That's what I want, right? This is Revelation chapter 14 and verse 14. Right, it reads, and I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. So John the Revelator saw Yahweh Shah in his fathership, right? He saw him in what they call a spaceship, if you can understand. It's what the world calls a mothership in movies. John the Revelator saw Yahweh Shah inside of the fathership now you can say well i didn't see it. i didn't say that it said white cloud he was sitting on the white cloud it's not talking about an actual white cloud right only white jesus would sit on a white cloud oh it's so soft it's like cotton oh no man the lord ain't coming back with a white cloud white is symbolic for righteousness purity and pious right the cloud it's symbolic for the aerial vehicle that the Lord created, which is the chariot. 
It's what the world calls the UFO. Now they call them UAPs, uh, spaceships, uh, unidentified aerial phenomena. Right? There's a lot of names they give them now. But John the Revelator saw you how was shy inside this chariot. Right? That's what this means. And he had a sharp sickle. Read on. And another angel came out of the temple. And what is a sickle? Right? We got to get these, um, these ancient tools. Right? We got to kind of know uh, husbandry to understand some of these breakdowns. Here's a sickle. It's somewhat of a scythe. Right? That's where you get the concept of the Grim Reaper from. They get it from the Bible. Because the Grim Reaper is really a death angel that, that harvests your soul. Right? So Yahweh Shai... All right, so here's Grim Reaper. See that? So he has a sickle, but it's really like a scythe. And he comes to take your life from you. They get that from the Bible. Because Yahweh Shai, he is the, uh, the ultimate reaper of souls. You know? Verse 15, Revelation 14 to 15. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to help that sat on the cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and reap for the time has come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. see that everything's growing and you got to get that fruit when it's ripe. if you got if you have grown tomatoes or bananas they can get overripe if you wait too long to harvest them they're no good if you try to get that banana too early or that tomato too early it's no good you got to get it right on time right when the picking is hot and then you get all of the nourishment and satisfaction of your labor. So shall it be in the end of the world. Yahweh Shah has planted man in the earth, has watered particular men and fed them with wisdom and knowledge and light, and has shed water upon them and let the rain of wisdom rest upon that seed, that they may grow in the knowledge of Yahweh Bashmi Yahweh Other things have been grown and planted, and, and they're going to grow up, but they're not going to bear fruit. That's why 2nd Ezra, the 8th chapter, Actually, yeah, the eighth chapter. Let's get this. Let's go to Second Ezra, chapter eight. Kind of go into this real quick. Second Ezra, chapter eight, and verse forty-three. It reads, "Like as the husbandman, I'm gonna start at forty-one. Like as the husbandman soweth much seed upon the ground, and planteth many trees." And yet the thing that is sown good and in season cometh not up. Neither doeth all that is planted take root. Even so is it of them that are sown in the world. They shall not all be saved. Everybody's not going to be saved. Just like not all of your crops were the first fruits. Only an elected amount were called to be the first fruits. The seed had no choice and you had no influence on that. It was all of divine providence. To determine what seeds were going to be the first fruits, who's going to come into this truth, who's going to be saved in the harvest, who's not going to be saved. That's what the feast of first fruits is going into on a spiritual level. So let's read this again. Leviticus chapter 23 and 10. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And that's the morrow after the Sabbath during that first month. And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheep and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering to the Lord. So they would wave the sheep, the priest, to be accepted by the Lord. And they will offer up a lamb as well. All right. Verse 13. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto Yahweh, Bashmi Abashai, for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hen. And this had to be exact. When the Mosai said two tenth deals, what would happen if you did three tenth deals or three halves or a quarter of a fine flour? If you decided to kind of not pay attention, you know, your mind was elsewhere. You was putting the flower. You, hey, hey, and then you offered it up. Hey, the Lord will kill you. This is very meticulous. You have to do this according to the letter. 
if the most sauce is the fourth part of a hand, you can't do a fifth part because you want to kind of, you know, do your, th do your own thing. It had to be the fourth part. It had to be exact. You had to watch that measurement and make sure it was done in order. Verse 14. And ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It should be a statue forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Right? So that, that's what that first fruits is going into. Let's read on. Leviticus 23 and 15. Let me see where I'm at with time. Okay. All right. Leviticus chapter 23 and 15. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. And now you're going to see your Pentecost. So you have your feast of first fruits, and then you're going to start counting seven Sabbaths, meaning 49 days. Right? Then you're going to add a day and that's going to be your Pentecost. Seven sevens. That's how you're going to count. All right. Even until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, ye shall number 50 days. Ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So after that feast of first fruits, after that, that time period, you're going to count your 50 days. On that 50th day is what we now call Pentecost. All right. Let's get that in Acts 2. Right, let's get that Acts chapter 2. Another name for Pentecost is the Feast of Harvest and also the Feast of Weeks. Right, quick precept Acts chapter 2 and 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So, what does Pentecost mean? It means 50 or penta meaning 50. Right. Here it is, the 50th day, right? The 50th day, the second of the three great Jewish feasts. Now, it says Jewish feasts, Israelite feasts, because your first major feast is what? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Your second major feast is what? The Pentecost. Your third major feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, all right? And within those three feast days, you have to come to Jerusalem. You didn't come to Jerusalem, you were cut off. Now you can say, I ain't feel like going, I got a headache, you know, maybe I'll make it next time, I'll catch up with y'all. If you didn't go to the, uh, Jerusalem for the Passover, the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of Tabernacles, and hey, the Lord cut you off, man. Let's read on. Celebrated at Jerusalem yearly, the seventh week after the Passover, in grateful recognition of the completed harvest. You see that? So it's all about the completed harvest. So right now we're in those days until that harvest, right? We're growing and hopefully bearing fruit and being watered and receiving light that we may be accepted in the day of the harvest. Okay? So that's what Leviticus 23 is going into. Now, there's another name again like i went into for this feast day let's go to uh, leviticus clock like exodus chapter 23 all right this exodus chapter 23 and verse 16. it reads and the feast of harvest the first fruits of thy labors which thou hast sown in the field and the feast of ingathering which is in the end of the year when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. So these are other two major feast days. One is the Feast of Harvest. What is the Feast of Harvest? That's another name for your Feast of First Fruits, even extending for your Pentecost. So sometimes you'll see different names attached to different feast days. All right? Feast of Harvest, Feast of Weeks, Feast of First Fruits. Pentecost. And then another name, which we'll get into shortly, Lord willing, is the Feast of Ingathering. That's your Feast of uh, Tabernacles. Right? So you have the, or also called the Feast of Booths. You know? So you also have to get acquainted with the uh, um, alternative names that Yahweh has given us. 
So let's go back to Leviticus. This is Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 16. Even until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number 50 days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be baking with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young bullock and two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering and their drink offering, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Then ye shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. And again, you can say, well, that's too much. Why would the Lord ask for so much? He's asking for a gold and a lamb and a burnt offering. Well, guess what? Bro? It is what it is. Because the Most High has commanded these things, man. This is the Lord's program. This is not man's program, right? And again, Jake, you make mac and cheese and sweet potatoes and you boil your ham hocks and wickedness and you, you, you let your chicken marinate and you get all into it, man. And wickedness. Now when brothers read this, oh, that's too much. Brother, you go all out for these wicked days, man. You know, you're lying to your boss to get out of work. You're spending, you know, two racks on, on your birthday, you know. Well, I'm going to do it big. It's my, you know, it's, it's the big 3-0. It's my 30, right? Jake called it. My, it's my Jordan. Yeah, I'm 23, right? You, you, got, you get all bugged out on New Year's, too. You're traveling to Times Square to be trampled by flesh and blood, you know? You're counting for the ball to drop like a big kid. You're celebrating Janus, the goddess, so-called god of duality and dimensions and portals, you know? So you... you you, you can't read this and be all uptight about it. Oh, the Lord, he, that's mean. That's too much. Well, well, if you didn't follow this, you, you'll see how the Lord deal with you, you know? Now, do you have to do this now? No, you don't have a temple. You don't have a priest. So you don't have bullocks and lambs and rams, you know? So let's read on. Leviticus chapter 23 and 19. Then ye shall sacrifice one kid. Of the goats for a sin offering and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruit for a wave offering before Yahweh. And the two with the two lambs, they should be holy to the Lord for the priest. And ye should proclaim on a self-same date, meaning that 50th day, that it may be a holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever in your dwellings throughout your generations. So that day, there's that's a holy convocation, right? There's no working on that day. No servile work. The only work that can be done is work that pertains to the feast day. That's on the 50th day. And that always falls on a so-called Saturday night to a Sunday night. Right, it always falls like that, you know, and it's always around the so-called uh, May, you know, May season. Sometimes it may extend to like early June, you know. And um, I had this. I may have it on me now. Let's see. Got these different books. Now this is um. Let me see if I can put this up from the Rose Chrono Chronological Guide of the Bible. Right, and it kind of gives you the different, let's see, crops and vegetation that would go during these feast days. Now, I didn't, I didn't plan on bringing it out, right? But um, I just want to see if I can't find it in a reasonable time, then we'll kind of move on, right? Let's see. Right, bear with me. Okay, they may not. I may not be in here, right? But there was it. Um, let's see. Okay, let me try one more thing. We got the creation. Like I said, they may they may have it in this one. All right, I have a few of these. They may not have it, but it kind of touches on the feast days as well, right? And I could probably look at, you know, we could probably look it online, look at it online. 
right to see what it is all right so you see that here it is right here so this is um and this is a good book to have it kind of helps put things into perspective right this is the rose uh chronological guide to the bible right now if you got this book you can get it i got this from a, a grocery store right this is page uh 40 and page uh, 41 so they actually give you the feast day calendar and they have the assyrian slash babylonian names of the feast days right nisan that's your month of a bit and it falls late march early april ayar uh savan tammuz ah elul tishrai heshvan keys left to vet right uh shavat and adar adar is the last month of the so-called year and they actually give you the time of the when these feast days operate so right now we're looking at the feast of pentecost and that always falls in your so-called third month so if your first month so like your so-called march april and then may right so like i said your pentecost will always fall chiefly on a so-called saturday night for the most part but also it's always going to fall around that may season which is your month of so-called savant you see that and your passover will always fall uh in a um, nissan or a bit you know then you have your feast of 11 bread and your first fruits so your first fruits is that sabbath during that feast but then you're going to count those 49 days and you're going to get to your feast of weeks or your pentecost all right like i said so they kind of go into it sometimes those visuals help provide a little more uh clarity and a little bit more understanding right when it comes to understanding uh um you know the feast days right so let's get back into it right let's get back into it and again i got that from like a, a giant right grocery store or you can get it from amazon it's no more probably than than 15 or so right and they have some on chronology where i'm not going to pull them all out but you got atlases timelines and a lot of that information helps you understand you know these feast days okay so pentecost is a sabbath it's regarded as a sabbath no servile work leviticus 23 and 22 and when ye reap the harvest of your land Thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord. All right, read on. Leviticus 23 and 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall have a Sabbath. A memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. And this feast day is coming up, right? This feast day is coming up. It's right around the corner. Let's pull it up, right? Let's pull it up. This feast day is right around the corner. And you want to be in the spirit for this feast, right? You want to be well prepared. Don't let this feast day fall and you not know what's going on. Because it's set, right now, it's a six month right it's the sixth month but the seventh month right that's going to start so-called september 14th at sundown right september 14th at sundown and that's in about three weeks or so during that day that is the memorial of blowing of trumpets that is the highest new moon that's why you're even Amalek, like they call it a uh, rosh hashanah or Ra'ash, meaning the head. They call it the head of the year. Their so-called beginning of the new year, right? Which is not really the, the new year, you know? They're thinking more of an agricultural kind of aspect, but that's not the new year. You know, the new year is the springtime. Nevertheless, you do have the Feast of Trumpets coming. Right? And we brothers got to get their shofar ready, right? If you don't have a shofar, you got to get a shofar. This is a shofar, right? This is a shofar. Now you can get a shofar, you know, for what? $20. You don't have to break bank, right? That's 22, right? That I mean, some of these things are kind of up there, 
right? I mean, some of these things are, you know, 135. I've seen shofars that are $200, $300, but you don't have to spend, you know, a, a lucrative amount, right? You know, you kind of, look, that's $28, $30, right? That's hand painted. That's 500, right? That's if, you know, that, that's, that's kind of high. So they got a strap. That's kind of tough with the strap on it, right? I, I, I wear that, wear that at camp. Right, put the shofar right there. I know brothers, we kind of put it on the thing, but I might show up with the, the strap shofar, right? With the staff in it. I kind of like that. I might, I might, I might look into that. Right. Now, do I have $119? No. Right. But hey, it's, it's, it's something to look into. So you can kind of get it. You want to have your shofar. Now, there are certain brothers they say, Well, no, can I do can I get one of these? No, you can't you can't get a uh you can't get one of these right well I, it still make the same sound right is and it comes in different colors no you can't get a kazoo a kazoo is not going to cut it right a flute is not going to cut it you have to get a shofar the lord is not dealing with the kazoo right you have to order your shofar or, or, or there's brothers that make them you know but you got to get it right now the feast of trumpets is literally about the second coming of Yahweh Shah on the deepest level. All right. So let's get a precept on the Feast of Trumpets. Let's go to Numbers chapter 10. All right. Let's go to Numbers chapter 10. All right. So you got to get your shofar ready, man. You got to get into this feast day. All right. Don't let these feast days uh, just pass you by. Right. And you don't know what's going on. Numbers chapter 10 and 10. Actually, it's like, I'm going to start at the top. Numbers chapter 10 and 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeys of the camp. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So in the ancient world, the priest would blow the, uh, the uh, trumpet, all right? And the trumpet was for gathering, for calling the elders, to journey, for war, right? So the trumpet served many purposes, right? Let's read on. And if they blow out with one trumpet, then the princes, which are the heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. So when you're blowing your shofar, when you get into that feast, they understand what those sounds represent. It's not just about blowing your shofar the loudest. It's about, hey, look, in the spirit, when this trumpet is blown, it's a representation of us supposed to be coming together. Coming together. Zephaniah 2 and 1 says what? Gather yourself together, O nation not desire. It's a calling of Israel to come out of the world, to come out of religion, to come out of folly, to come out of sin. Right to come out of politics, to come out of all of these damn lifestyles that are no profit to us. It's literally a calling to gather us together. You know, that's where that trumpet was blown, and all Israel will resort together. You know, and how are we gathering together now? What is that spiritual trumpet we're blowing? Well, right now the trumpet we're blowing is the word of the Most High. Right? Let's get that in Ezekiel, chapter thirty-three. This is Ezekiel, right? Chapter 33 and verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman. So the watchman, his job is to watch over the city and make sure that there was no enemy coming in. No Philistines, Edomites, any demons, right, manifested through these nations. And if you saw the archers or the cavalry or the soldiers coming in, he would blow the trumpet. Right? So the people could get ready for war, you know? And the watchmen, they didn't take days off, right? They worked hard hours out there, nighttime, suntime, rain, sleet, snow, hail, cool breeze. You understand? Whatever the humidity, they was out there because their job is to protect the people. 
you know verse three if when he seeth the sword come upon the land he blow the trumpet and warn the people so that trumpet is also a warning that destruction is coming that the most is about to bring a sword upon the land that world war three is about to happen that jacob's trouble is about to happen that armageddon draws not that a famine is brewing up an economic collapse if you can understand that all hell is going to break loose and the trumpet is being blown by the servants the prophets who are out there in the highways and byways charging you to repent come out of sin and keep the commandments in faith they're literally blowing the trumpet now you can say well i never saw a trumpet out there i seen with the bible seen with that red book but what do you mean the trumpet what well, the, the, hey, the trumpet is it's this word right that we're bringing out let's go to uh jeremiah right jeremiah the sixth chapter the lord said hearken to the sound of the trumpet right but they were not here jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 17 also i set watchmen over you saying hearken to the sound of the trumpet but they said we will not hearken and then they don't want to not eat pork they want to continually celebrate july 4th and celebrate christmas halloween thanks Dylan, wicked days and not come back to the most high right but the men of the lord and the daughters of zion they're going to hearken to the sound of the trumpet they're going to hear the word go out and they're going to say wow that's that sound from the ancient world to gather together that's that sound that war is coming that's that sound that we have to journey and get back to yahweh bashmi so that trumpet serves many purposes right and you had to hit that right trumpet sound because if you hit the wrong sound you might lead everybody astray right that's in first corinthians chapter 14. a key example is there was one note to blow the trumpet for war if you blew that note when it was really supposed to be to gather israel you would have put a spirit on the camp and vice versa if it was time for war but you blew the trumpet for gathering people would die when the enemy comes you know so you have to blow that right trumpet like with this word you got to push that right sound out there you can't be pushing the book of enoch you can't be saying all nations can be saved you can't be teaching that 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 america is not going to be destroyed you're giving an uncertain sound and you're going to cause a confusion to happen without the camp you know let's go to first corinthians chapter 14. see that this is first corinthians chapter 14 and 7 and even things without life giving sound whether pipe or a harp except they give a distinction in the sounds how shall it be known what is piped or a harp for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound who shall prepare himself to the battle yeah, if you're saying that america is not going to be destroyed how are people going to prepare to the battle if you say that that we're not going to have to um make be put the flight and jacob's trouble is not going to happen how are we going to prepare to the battle the lord said oh yeah my people make you ready to the battle and if those evils be even as what as pilgrims on the earth right this is second and verse 40 oh my people hear my word make you ready to the battle and in those evils be even as pilgrims upon the earth so you have to hear that trumpet and they look and say hey look i can't trust in the society i can't trust in the banking system i can't trust in the economy a stimulus package i can't trust in what these presidents are putting out there i have to know that hey look at any given time you know what could hit the fan and i have to have the mentality to be willing to let every material thing go and leave it behind not look back and move on and press towards the mark but that can only happen if you're hearkening to the sound of the trumpet. So that's what this feast day is about. This feast day is about the sounding of the trumpet, right? But it's also about the, a memorial. A, memo, a memorial is something that caused you to remember something. So you're also remembering the works of the Most High, how the Lord used the trumpet sound in the time of war. He delivered us during the time of Moses, uh, Joshua, right? When we received the law. Remember, we received the law with an exceeding great trumpet. So there's a lot to think about during the Feast of Trumpets, right? This is um, Exodus chapter 19 and verse, let's 
see, 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. See that? So when you when you how Bashmi came down to give Israel the law, what was there? The trumpet. So part of that memorial is to remember, hey, look, this is a charge for me to make sure I'm being obedient to the law. Right? This is a charge for me to make sure that, hey, look, I'm, a, I'm going according to the Torah. I'm following the commandments. Right? Because in time past on this feast day, this is the same trumpet sound of when we received the law. But this is also the same time that this is war going on. So you, you want to be into heavy meditation on these feast days because there's a lot of spiritual undertones behind them. From And we're covering all of them through the spirit and power of Yahweh, Bashem Yahweh Shai. All right, let's get another um, one more precept dealing with the trumpet. Let's go to Isaiah 27. Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 12. And this shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. So the Most High is going to cut Esau off, and the elect are going to get beamed up. One by one, rather you're in L.A., England, uh, uh, Jamaica, New York, right? Here's the point. And this shall come to pass in that day, meaning the day that we are delivered, that the great trumpet shall be blown. You see that? And they shall come, which are ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcast in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. So that trumpet's going to... Calendar. Mark your calendar, that feast day. Let's pull it up again. And we have the calendar posted on um, social media, chiefly on Instagram, right? September 14th at sundown. That is the memorial of blowing of trumpets. So let's read on in Leviticus. This is Leviticus chapter 23 and verse, let's see. 20, uh, 25. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So that day is a Sabbath day. There's no buying, no selling on that day. You can't cook. You can't do work that pertains to the feast day, but you cannot do work for service. That's the first day of the seventh month. And then you have the Day of Atonement, right? Leviticus 23 and 26. All right, let me see where I'm at with time. Okay. Leviticus 20, making good time through the spirit. So all praises. Leviticus chapter 23 and 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also, on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So you have three high holy days in the seventh month. And those are spiritual numbers, right? Three is a spiritual number that means emphasis. Seven is a number that we already went into that means completion and or perfection, right? So this feast day falls on the 10th day of the seventh month. That day is called the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is a day to make an atonement for your soul. Now, how do we make atonement for our soul today? By repenting in the name of Yahweh Shah. You understand in the ancient world, when you read Leviticus, the 16th chapter, the high priest will go in into the holiest of holies and sprinkle the blood. And that blood would make an atonement for our soul. Right. He would do it for himself and for the people. But now we our atonement is Yahweh Shai. And I believe it is written. Right. Right. Let's get this preset. I want to get a quick preset. And I'm looking, I'm meditating on another one. Right. Let's go to Hebrew chapter seven first. Right, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26. But this whole, whole, I mean, this whole chapter, whole Hebrews is good, man. Right, but I'm going to just read Hebrews chapter 7 and 26. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, 
undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And that's speaking of Yahweh Shah. You had a, you had two priesthoods. You have the Arianic priesthood or the Levitical priesthood with the high priest that come from Aaron, right? And uh, Phineas and Eleazar, etc. And then you have Yahweh Shah's priesthood, which is called the Order of Melchizedek. Now, the men of the Lord that are ministers in these last days, you are a priest under the priesthood of the Order of Melchizedek. That priesthood overrides the Levitical priesthood for a wide variety of, of reasons, which time will not allow me to go into tonight. And we may go into the book of Hebrews in a separate lesson because that's a deep, deep book. And there's a lot of different concepts in it within itself, you know, and, and you don't want to kind of rush through anything like that. But right now, Hebrews chapter 7 and 26 is speaking about Yahweh Shah, right? Verse 27, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. So the high priest will have to offer up sins for himself and for the people on the day of atonement. All right. And they had to do it every year. And every year Israel was wicked. And every year they would go off, and every year they were subject to sin and vanity. You know, verse 28. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. So Yahweh Shai is that new consecrated high priest by which we receive. It's like here. The atonement. Let's get that by which he received the atonement. All right, quick precept. This is the book and Slakia. Like Romans chapter 5 and 11. It reads, Con. And not only so, but we also joy in the most high through our Lord Yahweh Shahamashiach. By whom also, it's like about whom we have now received the atonement. So the day of atonement is a feast day, but it's not a day of eating food. Okay, this is a day of fasting. A day of humbling your soul. A day of the self-examination. A day of, of sackcloth and ashes. And humbling your soul in the sight of Yahweh. It's a day of afflicting your soul. Okay, and you're going to the Most High and you're asking Yahweh to forgive you of your sins. Now you can say, well, I do that every day. I don't have to do that. Who, is, who does he think he is? For hey, well, look, brother, right? That's what this day is, man. It is a day to make atonement for your soul all day. No eating, no drinking. You're fasting. And no work. You know, no, no manner of work, not even servile work. No, no, nothing. And Yahweh Shai is your atonement, right? Let's go to Revelation chapter one. And if you want to kind of get more in depth into uh, the day of atonement, you know, I encourage brothers to read uh, Leviticus chapter 16, right? When you read Leviticus chapter 16, right, you kind of go in depth into it. Right, this is Leviticus. It's like I want this quick precept, just dealing with the atonement. Revelation chapter one and five. It reads, and from Yahweh Shai Hamashiach, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see that? So the Lord washed us from our sins, right? You may have been a fornicator, a drunkard, a defile of your temple, right? You may have been, you know, whatever, man, a whore as a woman, a whoremonger as a man, a Sabbath breaker, a murderer, an idolater, you know? But guess what? You could have been a warlock, a witch, you know, eating unclean foods and just defiling your flesh. 
but Yahweh shall wash us. And he washed our spirits and cleansed us through his blood. So you have to acknowledge Yahweh Shai as the atonement, right? Yahweh Shai is the atonement. Now, let's go back to this. Leviticus 23 and 27. When it reads, it shall be a holy convocation, that's true. You have to gather together on the day of atonement, right? You should be gathering together and afflicting your souls with like-minded men. You know, you may be going, you know, you may be fasting, repenting together. You know, brothers pray together. We pray together all the time, chiefly, you know, a lot on the Day of Atonement. You know, brothers, we bring the sackcloth, you know, the ashes. We may do a quick live, you know, uh, um, you know, brothers pray. You know, we confess our faults to one another. We acknowledge our sins, right? You know, there, there's a lot, you know, we make sure we reaching out to everybody that we may have had an art with. You know, anybody that you may have had an altercation with when you feel like it wasn't reconciled or there may have been some bad blood or any type of potential grudge that may be brewing, you want to dead all of that, right? On that day, all that stuff should be dead on that holy convocation. This is what this means when it says, and ye shall afflict your souls. That's fasting, right? Fasting is no eating or drinking, no brushing your teeth, no tasting anything. Right, let's get this in uh, Jonah. Right, chapter three. Right, let's get this. Right, so you want to afflict your soul to Yahweh, Bashmi Oshai. Jonah three and seven. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. So in that day, it's not just a day where I'm hungry. No, you're afflicting your soul. And you want to prep for that day. You know, and if you're not fasting now, that day of atonement is going to root you out. And you're not going to endure that day. So you want to make sure you're fat, get into that routine of at least fasting once a week now. So that day doesn't destroy you, man. You know, you don't want to spend that day in a hospital. Because you're about to die. Because you never fasted before. You just ate dinosaur nuggets, hoagies, stuffed crust, and deep dish, man. You got to train the flesh as well. Right? So let's go back to this. Leviticus chapter 23. For it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted, and that same day he should be cut off from among his people. So if you don't fast that day, the Most High is going to destroy you. He's going to kill you. That's how heavy it is. If you don't fast on that day, you will be put to death. It's not, and if you work that day, you got to call out. The Day of Atonement, if I'm not mistaken, falls on a so-called Saturday night to Sunday night. Right, so if you work Saturday nights or after the Shabbat or you work Sundays, you got to call out. You got to put in some sick time, vacation time, UPT, PTO, uh, a vacation time, bereavement, right? Uh, you better figure something out. You better start looking at your time and figuring out this thing now. And it can't be what well, they really needed me to come in. They told me they really needed me today. To hell with them. This is about Yahweh Bashmi Shai. It's about your salvation. But uh, what if they say they really, really need me? What if they give me double time? What about time and a half? What if they give me a big promotion? You know? Hey, 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 look, man. You better figure this thing out and weigh things in the balance and see what's, what's important. No Israelite should, no, no Israelite is working on that day. You know? Let's read on. Leviticus chapter 22 and 30. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. See that? So the Lord told you. If you do any work on that day, you're going to be destroyed. Don't have that. I just got to do that. You got Jake. 
you got damn, you got that OCD spirit. I just got to do the dishes. I, I just have to. The Lord understands. It's just that one cup. You keep walking past. I, I got to do it. Then you start washing that dish. You have a heart attack and die, man. Or the Holy Spirit leave you on spot. And you forget all of the precepts and all of the wisdom. And now you're back in the world. I just got to gotta vacuum that once. I got to sweep up that pile of trash. Oh, the trash, he just thinks, forgot to take the trash out. Let me just tie it and take it out. Take the trash out, throw it in the dumpster, and then next thing you know, you, you, the most odd cuts you down, huh? You get hit with a straight bullet, right? Somebody rear end you, and, and you get hit by a car, and they, somebody come through and rob you and, and kill you, right? Or some wild beast come tear you in pieces. It's a fearful thing, man, to fall into the hands of the living God. Leviticus 23 and 31. You should do no manner of work. That's no sweeping, a pile, no wiping a dish down, no ironing a, a, a damn sock, right? No work. Well, well, can I can I do this? Can I can I no? Well, what if the Lord don't see me? A lot of brothers, you think the Lord don't see you, man. Hey, hey, the Lord said that the eyes of the Lord. I'm going to stay in the same uh, chapter. I'm going to actually jump down. Let me get this precept. This Leviticus, I mean, it's like a second Ezra chapter 16 and 62. Yea, and the spirit of almighty God, which made all things and searcheth out. He knoweth your inventions and what you think in your hearts, even them that sin and will hide their sin. So the Lord, he's all in your mind. You can't hide from the Lord, man. You can't uh, secretly, I'm going to just kind of clean up, the, the pick up the toys that my daughter left or my son left or the children left because it's just giving me a bad, bad vibe. Pick that toy up if you want to. Man. Then you got brothers saying, well, you're being over-righteous. I can sweep up that pile. Okay, okay, all right, do it. Y'all brothers and watchmen, y'all are over-righteous. If I need to take that trash out, the Lord knows my heart. All right? That's fine. Take the trash out. All right? We, we, we just wash our hands. We, we told you, man. Right? We're not going to be emotional about Yahweh Bashmi Abashah's commandments. Right? Now that we're going to be a respected person or bend a branch. Let's read this again. Leviticus chapter 23 and 31. Ye shall do no manner of work. It should be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. So if you, even if you have a family, they're supposed to keep the devil told You, your wife, your children, right? You know, even your beast. In the book of Jonah, we read that, guess what? They said, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything, Right? So that's how serious fasting is. Chiefly the Day of Atonement, right? The Day of Atonement. Verse 32. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls. And the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. So that's the Sabbath. No bind on that day. Then there, there was this doctrine going on, I believe about two years ago. It resurfaces all the damn time. Well, brothers say, well, hold on now. You can eat on that day. Isn't it a feast day? Isn't Leviticus 23 about the feast days? Should we eat on that day? There are men that actually cook on that day and, and eat, and they eat fat, right? They drink the wine on the lees, right, and, and eat the fat and mirth and chant to the sound of the vow, like I tell you in uh, Amos, the sixth chapter, man. Because they say, well, it said these are the feasts of the Lord. Well, the day of atonement is not a it's not a, a, a day of eating or drinking. All right, we're just putting that out there, man. All right? It's not a day of eating and drinking. Leviticus 23 and 33. Right? Leviticus 23 and 33. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The 15th day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. So your 
one of your last, not the last, but one of the last major high holy days is the Feast of Tabernacles. I know a lot of brothers, that's their favorite feast day, right? The Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles is also called the Feast of Ingathering, right? We brought that out before. Let me bring it out again, right? Then I'm going to go back to uh, Exodus 23. Okay, this is the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 16 and verse 13. Right? It reads, Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after that. It's so like after that thou was gathered in thy corn and thy wine. So the Feast of Tabernacles is another harvest feast day. But it falls at the end of the agricultural year. And you always know it's a feast of tabernacle season because there's always what you call a um a harvest moon. I think they call it a harvest or a hunter's moon. See that? So it's chiefly there's always a, a the largest moon of the year during the time of the seventh month. So you brothers have been in the truth for quite some time. You you, you begin to notice that. That, hey, look, every time around the time of the seventh month, there's always a large moon out there. Now, why did the Mosai have the largest moon during the seventh month? Well, think about it. You have to keep the wild beast away because the beast come out at night, right? The beast come out. That's in Psalms chapter 104, right? Thou uh, makest the sun go down with a wild beast of the, um, of the forest do creep forth, paraphrasing. So if you have that light, it keeps those wild beasts away. While you uh, while you have more time to harvest your crops, and that bright moon lasts a lot longer in the night than the other moons, so you you have the Most High gave you more time to get all of those crops in, and to keep those beasts away, and that you can see what you're doing. You know, it's not a it's not by accident. Psalms chapter one hundred four and verse twenty: Thou makest darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. But the most I gave you that moon to kind of keep them wild beasts away from you. So they could kind of stay in the night. You could gather in your corn and you could kind of gather in your wine. And when you study the seventh moon, the harvest moon lasts the longest. See, we kind of get some understanding behind that. See that? Check this out. About three nights, the harvest moon, whose names grew out of its utility to farmers, who harvested crops in the fall before the advent of artificial lightning will appear full for about three nights. And it's the full moon that occurs closest to the September. The Most High did that. The Most High created that moon at that set time for a set purpose. It's literally called the harvest moon for the Israelites. Not for the Edomites, not for the Moabites, for us as a people, Yahweh Bashmi Abashai has given us the moon for signs, seasons, days, and years. So when you saw that large moon, you know, hey, that's a sign. I got three days to get all of my corn and wine in. Let me not play any games. Let me get out there and bring my whole sons and my family out there and start harvesting. Right? I got three days to get it all done. And it's hard work when you harvest them, huh? You can't, it's not like DoorDash now or you know, Instacart and Grubhub and Postmates, you can just, hey, look, can you bring me an ears of corn and a bag of apples? Ten minutes later, show up at your door. Well, you was out there with a sickle, you know? You was out there sweating by the bra. It was hot out there, humid. And you got, if you got a big, big landmass, you, you know, you got to tend to, the, you got a lot of work you got to do. You got three days to get it done. So after you got it done, it was a beautiful time to rejoice. Say, hey, look, the most high, not only did he give us a harvest, he gave us time to kind of gather it all in. All praise to Yahweh Bashmi Abashai. And he gave us a feast day on top of that. So that's what the Feast of Tabernacles uh, uh, relates to on, on a husbandry agricultural you know, standpoint. You know, but remember, we're also going into the spiritual side of things. We covered that harvest. Right, we cover what that harvest truly means. Another name for this is called the Feast of Ingathering. All right, let's get that in Exodus 23. 
right? Exodus chapter 23, and we brought it out before 16. It reads, and the feast of harvest, that's your Pentecost, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, that's, it, that's your feast of tabernacles, which is in the end of the year. But thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. See that? So it's the end of the agricultural year. Because remember, the seventh month is not the end of the um, annual year. So you have different cycles that we deal with, right? As a people, we deal with a uh, sabbatical cycle, meaning we have six days of work, one day of rest. We deal with the land Sabbath cycle. So we have six days of tilling the land, then you have a Sabbath of rest. We have a servile cycle. So we have six days of servitude and then a year of release, which is the seventh year. You have a lunar cycle that operates in the 29.5 days. You have an agricultural cycle that is operating between the first month and the so-called seventh month, right? You have a jubilee cycle and you're counting your 49 years, right? And your 50th year is a year of jubilee. So you have a lot of cycles amongst us as a people that you're kind of dealing with simultaneously. So the end of this year is not the end of your annual year. Just like a job, but your job may have a fiscal year. You have a fiscal year and you have a calendar year in corporate America. Your calendar year is the beginning of your year, January 1st, all the way up to December 31st. You have a fiscal year. A fiscal year is more of a financial year to accomplish goals, bring in revenue, right? Let me pull that up. What is a fiscal year? See that? A year reckoned for taxing or accounting purposes. You see that? So even Esau has different kind of cycles he's dealing with. He has his calendar year, his fiscal year. We have our annual year or our calendar year, and we have an agricultural year. Our agricultural year tends to end around the time of the seventh month. Because now you got to remember what, what's happening after this time. The winter time is going to come in. You're not going to be able to breed crops and, you know, be out there in the elements. Right? So that this lets you know, hey, look, this is the end all be all. The end of the year. Right? So let's read on in Leviticus about this feast day. Actually, I want to go back to Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16 and 14. And thou shalt rejoice in thy feast, thou and thy son, and thy daughter, and thy manservant, and thy maidservant, and the Levite, the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow that are within thy gates. Seven days shalt thou keep a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God, and the place which the Lord shall choose, which, which, which is Jerusalem, because the Lord thy God shall bless thee, and all thine increase, and in all the works of thine hands, therefore thou shalt surely rejoice. Three times in the... Oh, that, so that's it on that, right? So let's go to Leviticus 23, so we can read more about this feast week. All right, we're going to read more about the feast week. Leviticus chapter 23 and 34 again. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying... The 15th day of the seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be in holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. And ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. And ye shall do no servile work therein. So the first day is regarded as a Sabbath, and the eighth day, which is the seventh day of sundown, is regarded as a Sabbath. No buying, no selling, no work on those days, unless it pertains to the feast day. The eighth day and the great last day of the Feast of Tabernacles is a solemn assembly. It's a holy calling, a very solemn day, right? So I want to jump down. Let's jump down Leviticus 23 and 39. Let's read more about the Feast of Tabernacles. Right? It reads, Also, in the 15th day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, 
ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day sh shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of the go of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Right? And ye shall keep it. A feast, and you have to actually do this. See, right now you can kind of buy a tent from Amazon, Walmart, Target, right? Get you a tent, right? Get you a, you know, whatever. Back in the ancient world, they, they was getting it in. They was getting it in. They was building this stuff offhand. The, the Apostle Paul was a tent maker. Priscilla and Aquila, right, were tent makers, you know? So let's read on. And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statue forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. Right? So if you're an Israelite, you're going to dwell in a tent during those seven days. So brothers should be kind of thinking about that already. Right? Okay, I got to get me a tent. Okay, okay, where do I get one? How do I save up for one? Okay, where am I going to get it? How much does it cost? You know, is it going to be big enough for me? Okay, where am I going to set my tent up at? Okay, do I have this field? Maybe this park? Am I going to congregate? Going to link up with brothers? So you got to kind of, you know, think about this thing, man. Because it's right around the corner, right? I mean, let's let's pull up the calendar again. We talked about the uh, Feast of Trumpets. That is September 14th at sundown. Then the Day of Atonement is September 23rd at sundown. And then your Feast of Tabernacles is September 28th, right, through October 6th. So you want to be mindful of these things. Now, the spiritual meaning behind the Feast of Tabernacles is understanding that our fathers were in the wilderness dwelling in booths, right? A tabernacle is something that's temporary. You understand? A tabernacle... Is something that's here today and going tomorrow. Now, it was a representation of us being in a temporary estate before we entered into the kingdom or the promised land. We only dwelt in booths and the wilderness until we entered into the promised land. So when you're dwelling in your booth, there's a remembrance of the estate that you're in before you enter into the kingdom. And right now, our earthly bodies are booths. This is the tabernacle that we dwell in, right? The um, let's see, let's get wisdom of Solomon. I'm thinking of three precepts, and I want to get one, and wisdom of Solomon. Then I want to get one, and uh, First Peter, right? I want to get another one. I want to go back to Second Corinthians. So first, let's get wisdom of Solomon, the ninth chapter, about this earthly tabernacle, right? This is Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 9 and 15. For the corruptible body presseth down the soul, and the earthy tabernacle weareth down a mind that museth upon many things. So your yeah, body is a tabernacle, a temporary dwelling. See, this body is temporary. Just like that tabernacle and that booth that we had in the wilderness, that was temporary. We were only supposed to be there as sojourners until we entered into the promised land. Your, your tabernacle now, which is the body that you dwell in, rather you're tall or short, small or great, fat, skinny, large, whatever, you understand? You, your body is an earthly tabernacle, and your spirit is the occupant of that tabernacle. Now, you are hoping and longing for your spirit to be in a permanent tabernacle, a permanent dwelling place, which is a spiritual body. Another thing about a tabernacle is it can be easily destroyed. Right, it could be blown away with the wind. Right, it could be knocked down by man. That's how this body is. It could feel pain, passion, headaches, migraines, depression. Right, so the Feast of Tabernacles is a correlation to the bodies that we dwell in now. These temporary bodies and our temporary estate until we get into the promised land all over again. Right, let's get um, and and we're in the wilderness too. Right, we're in a spiritual wilderness as well, dwelling in these tabernacles. Let's get uh first Peter chapter five. 
right? Let's see. As long as I am in this. Let's see. Bear with me. I want to get this precept. Maybe second Peter. Right. Well, uh, Peter said, as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up. Right. Let's get this precept. Come on, second Peter chapter one. Right. So like it is second Peter chapter one and verse. 13. Yay, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Was that talking about him dwelling in the actual booth in the desert? No. It's talking about his body. His spirit dwells in the booth for an extended period of time. So the Lord takes him out of that and puts him right to where he has to dwell at, which is that spiritual body. Knowing that I, it's like in knowing that shortly, I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord, Yahweh Shai, Hamashiach, hath showed me. Then he has to die. He has to leave that this corruptible temporary body. Right? So right now we dwell in booths. We dwell in tabernacles. We dwell in a body that's here today, going tomorrow. We dwell in a tabernacle that could be destroyed and blown away with the gust of the wind. And we're longing to have a more permanent dwelling place. That's why we went to 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter earlier. And uh, we didn't finish it, but it reads in this week earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is in heaven right this is second corinthians chapter five and verse four for we that are in this tabernacle do grow being burdened and it is a burden to dwell in this tabernacle just like when you outside it's a burden it's not comfortable at times it's cold it's wild beast out there you don't have access to a lot of things that you really are comfortable with. You know, you, it's not a comfortable sleeping arrangement at times. And, you know, things can happen out there and you're constantly watching just like in his body. You know, your life is subject to death by the enemy. You're oppressed. Right. You could drop dead at any second. So we do groan in his body being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality may be swallowed up in life. So we're looking to get out of a mortal state and transition to an immortal state. Just like our forefathers were in that temporary living situation in the wilderness, longing and hoping to enter into a permanent dwelling place, a house, which is the land of Israel given to our fathers, man. Right? So just like in the ancient world, we dwelt in tents in the wilderness, but also... We're dwelling in tents in the wilderness. This is a wilderness. Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 5. Or verse 6. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sink. For in the wilderness, right, shall waters break out and streams in the desert. See that? So the Mosai is letting you know straight up and down that you're dwelling in the booth right now. Right, you're dwelling on a very spiritual level, right? Verse 7 And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, and the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. So, you're, I mean, you're subject to dragons, serpents in the wilderness. Wild beast is an amazing amount of, of sunlight that beats you down and the, the, the nights are cold. The elements are against you. Right? Wild beasts are against you. Right now we're dealing with wild beasts. These nations, their wicked ways, corrupt systems, uh, 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 governments rooted in sin and injustice, dwelling in this tabernacle. So when you're in that feast of tabernacles, you're not just, it's not a, a, a camping event. A lot of brothers, oh, we're going camping. You're not going camping. You're keeping the Lord's holy day, right? And in your mind, you're thinking about the harvest, the ingathering of fruits and wondering if your fruit is going to be acceptable, but you're also thinking and longing to be removed from this corruptible body to a spiritual body, right? And, and that's going to happen through the mercy of the Mosa, through your faith and through your works, right? So this is that wilderness that you dwell in.
Give me one more on that. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of the Most High, that they should feed her there a thousand, two hundred, and threescore days. Right? You see that? So right now, we're in the wilderness being nourished by the serpent for a set period of time. So we covered the major high holy days, right? We covered um, the feast of unleavened bread, first fruits, and the uh, Pentecost, right? We covered the uh, memorial blowing of the trumpets, the day of atonement, the feast of tabernacles. Again, there are other high holy days that we didn't get into that aren't listed in Leviticus 23. We didn't touch on the day of Simon, right? We didn't touch on the destruction of Nicanor. We didn't touch on a feast of dedication, neither did we touch on Purim. Right, we can go into those topics in the book of Esther and first and second Maccabees. You can read about those on your own. Um, quick announcement Hell on the Harbor, we're going to keep talking about it. Starts this so called Friday, extends through Sunday. The flyer is posted, it's all on social media. Um, if you have any questions, reach out. We're uh, encouraging brothers and sisters to fulfill Zephaniah 2 and 1, make a sacrifice, gather together, come out to the Baltimore. Right. And uh, uh, labor, fellowship and congregate with us. It should be a beautiful event. Um, but with that, I'm going to close up, giving, of course, our honor and glory to Yahweh. Again, if you have any questions with that event, hit up the email. Watch me for Israel 77 at gmail.com. Kwam Yashala. Shalom.